David Johnson's like, there's one button you have to push to make all this work. Good morning. It's really good to be with you this morning. And if you're in church or you're in the hall, we're delighted that you're here with us. It's great to have the problem of having people in the hall to be at capacity in the building and then to be in the hall, to have as many people as we can gather for as long as we need to do this. We all yearn for the point where it's safe and we're able to be here and you're able to come and have tea and coffee beforehand and after and just stay. But we're not there yet. But we're really glad that you're here with us because this is better than your living room. It's better to be in church than to be in the house in your own. And if you're at home, we're glad that you're with us. But really, there's a huge value in being physically together. Let me just bring you a couple of announcements just to keep it at the front of your head. Congregational committee is on Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock in the church. We will meet for Zoom prayer this evening at 8 o'clock, or upper Zoom, as I heard somebody call it um, during the week, which made me laugh. I think it's a good name for the, the prayer meeting we gather well, online, but to pray together and to pray for the church family, but also the world that we're in. Youth Fellowship begins this Sunday um, tonight in the McKinley Hall at uh, 7 o'clock to half past 8. And so if you go to secondary school, we'd love you, we'd love you to come to that um, as we begin to have in-person meetings. We'd love you to be part of that. And parents and toddlers began last Thursday, and they'll be meeting again this Thursday. And there's a little bit of documentation that needs to be completed, um, but we'll try and fit as many people in as we safely can. It was disorientating to have so many people in the house. It's disorientating to be around people at this stage after two years, but it was great to have mums and tots, our parents and tots, um, resume again. And Friday Club um, is on again on Friday. So if you're somebody in primary, we'd love them. If, if you have grandchildren or nephews and nieces, we'd love to see them on Friday night at 7. Um, come and join us in the hall. And hopefully we won't have too many, but hopefully that's a good problem to have. And I'll be asking for more volunteers for that. Two, two areas of church life where we do need a little bit more help. Um, and it is less arduous at the moment, but we need some help with stewarding as this continues. So people need to be stewarded well. Um, it's not as um, laborious as it was before where people are being ticked off and monitored in that sense um, because we're able to track it um, by taking pictures each week and most people are regulars, which we're grateful for. But if you're able to help steward, and the more people we have, the less you'll be on, but really we're looking for once a month, once every six weeks, John Lindsay is the person to speak to. And if that's something you can help us with, we'd be really grateful of that. And the other request to speak to Andy McClelland about is if you, would, if you are able and you feel technically competent enough to help us to stream. So we have a very small group of people who are doing the IT to stream, and they're great. They would say that they don't fully understand all of it, so you don't need to be a technical expert, but you do need to understand how computers work. So they're not gonna bring, begin a two-month course to teach you how a computer works and what a mouse is, but you do need to have some level, but you don't need to be an expert at YouTube broadcasting. But if that's something that you think you'd be able to help, you can also just go and find out more about it without having to commit yourself to find out how it works and how you might be able to help. But if that's something you could do, we would love you to step into that um, because people have been doing this for a long time and keeping this going so that people outside of the building have been able to join with us. Those are just a number of announcements. You'll see the rest on the page. As we come in to worship this morning, I was reminded this morning in the house, it feels like we're holding much of life together. And we gather in church this morning and remind ourselves together that it is God who carries us. That it is God who carries us through this. Thankfully, it's not Boris. It's not Sage. It's not Neffet. It's not government policy. It's not local government policy or politicians. But God holds us together. And in this period of time, often we think that we are the ones holding life together. And we're holding it together like a thread. Psalm 62 reminds us. Truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall never be shaken. We all need to hear that again today. We all need to hear that every day as we live our lives through a pandemic that we will talk about in generations to come. But this is what it looks like week on week. And we do need to remind ourselves that we're not the ones who hold this together, but God is the one who holds us. Let's worship God together and Helen is leading us this morning. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. This is the God that we come to worship this morning. But our God is the Lion. Our God is the Fortress. 
He is roaring with power and fighting our battles. And those are the truths that we come to proclaim and the promises that we come to claim. We're going to sing two songs back to back. Boys and girls, we haven't forgotten about you. So straight after this, stay um, standing and we will sing You Are the Light of the World as well. Let's stand together as we worship.
Last Sunday we sang as our kids sung, You Are Everywhere. And unintentionally in our family rhythm of life, there was a point in the afternoon, Malachi was sitting in front of the TV playing his video game and he was singing away, You Are Everywhere. Lily in the, um, on the stairs at one stage was humming it. I realized as I did the dishes that I was singing it, which you were all spared, thankfully. Um, and then in the car on the way to school on Monday, in a rare moment of Disney joy, we all sang it, which is not something that happens whenever we're going to school in the mornings. Often we're arguing about ties and brushing your teeth and all those things. I name that to you not to talk about my family, but to go, it's so important that worship forms us and praise forms us. And in your house, you can put on whatever it is that you like to listen to, but it's that rhythm of being able to sing the truth and praise to God, just as you're going about your daily business. I can't feed back every week that our family sings praise music as we go about our daily. That's, but there are moments whenever you're living your life and you're being reminded of God's truth at a heart level and a head level as you go about it. I'd encourage you to do it. You can put it on your phone. You can type in what we've sang on Sunday or you can type in something that from your childhood. It's all there on YouTube, goodness. And you can sing along as you're doing things around the house because it shapes and forms us. It reminds us that he is the light of the world, but also that he is the lion and the lamb. He is the one we bow before, and we're going to do that now in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, as we are reminded in praise of what we believe, as we declare that every name or every knee will bow in front of you, that you are both lion and lamb, you are the one who allowed himself to die for us, while also being the lion, the one who is stronger than all. The picture language of scripture enables us to understand who you are. And we thank you for your Bible. We thank you for the scriptures, your word to us. We thank you as it speaks directly into our lives, but as it reveals who you are and in turn who we are in light of you. We confess today that we don't always live in the rhythms that you designed for us the way of life that you created for us where we would thrive and do well, not always successfully in the world's terms, but to live as your people in your ways. And so we confess that even in this past week, we have not always lived in the ways that we should. And we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your grace, knowing that for those who turn again afresh to you, there is always grace and mercy, forgiveness and restoration. Father, help us this morning as we worship. Help us in the church. Help us in the hall. Help us if we're watching at home or somewhere else later this day. Help us in these moments to worship you in our heads and in our hearts and with our minds. We ask that you would captivate our thinking and our feelings. The sense of who we are would be utterly entranced by you above all. We bow our heads before you because ultimately we will bow everything in front of you. You are the Lord of our lives. And so help us now to worship you in these strange days. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen, Amen. If the boys and girls would like to go out to glue. I should dance to that, George. <laughs> Great. And we're going to continue to worship God. So when I went back to school after um, Christmas, uh, a few of our department asked if I would join them in abstaining from chocolate for charity for a period of time. And I said, oh, okay, that sounds good. And I said, so how long is it? The month of January? And they said, no, no, we're having no chocolate for a year. <laughs> At which point I was like, I'm out absolutely not happening and I said you would not want to work with me if I had no chocolate for a year um, no cauliflower no broccoli okay I can go with that but no chocolate for a whole year I would have probably managed it for the month of January but not for the year I knew my limits okay I was sweet tooth and there was no way I was coping with that for a whole year um, so yeah I knew that um, that temptation would be just too big um, and I would fail before I'd even started and it reminded me that temptation is never packaged in a form that is easy to discern. That's why it's temptation. And we see um, in this passage in Nehemiah today that the curveballs that come his way seem to be very respectable. 
but he needed discernment and he needed wisdom to follow on in God's ways. I was listening this week to a podcast by Timothy Keller. I put it on in the car on the way up to school. And I love Keller. He's a, he's a brilliant communicator and he's very down to earth and makes it very clear for us. And he was talking about having wisdom. And he said one of the things that really bugs him is when people come to him and say, will you pray for me for wisdom? Or I'm just going to pray for a few weeks for wisdom. Like it comes in a separate package. Like it's this little entity that God drops into our lives, you know, at the times when we need it. And Keller says, don't come and ask me to pray for wisdom. He says, if you're immersed in God's kingdom, if you're immersed in the things of God, if you're immersed in the word of God, you are standing in it. You're standing in God's wisdom if you're immersed in him. Stay daily close to God. Drink and eat from his word. Pray constantly and always looking to God, not to ourselves. Psalm 121, which we're going to sing in just a minute. I'll read it from the message. It says, I look up to the mountains. Does my strength come from the mountains? No. My strength comes from God who made heaven and earth and mountains. He won't let you stumble. Your guardian God won't fall asleep, not on your life. Israel's guardian will never doze or sleep. God's your guardian, right at your side to protect you, shielding you from sunstroke, sheltering you, from moonstroke. God guards you from every evil. He guards your very life. He guards you when you leave and when you return. He guards you now. He guards you always. of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place though I walk through the wilderness blessed be your name and every blessing you
Thank you, band, and George, and David, and Alan for enabling us to worship. 
Psalm 121 has a special resonance in our part of the world. You have the Belfast Hills, you have the Antrim Glens. I wonder what they do in Kildare and the Curra, where it's just flat for miles. Do they sing, I lift my eyes up to the hills? We are reminded all around us that our help doesn't come from what's around us in the hills. It comes from the one we worship, the maker of heaven and earth. We're in Nehemiah 6 this morning. I'd love you to follow along with us as we read the chapter. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sanballat sent his assistant to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, and I strengthened my hands. One day I went to the house of Shemaniah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehedabel, who was shut in at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors, because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent them, but but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me, so I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Noida and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them for many in Judah were under oath to him. Since he was son-in-law to Shekinah, son of Aram, and his son Johanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Barakiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. (coughs) This is our reading this morning. To sit in Nehemiah, as we hopefully do with all of Scripture, if we're to really engage with the story, ask questions of us. Nehemiah is involved in building the physical city and also in building the people. 140 years after exile, they are unformed, or at least they have been deformed by 140 years of not being where they were meant to be. Some were left behind when they were conquered, the remnant in a physical place, but by no means a nation or a people. In fact, we saw in chapter 2 that Nehemiah comes back from Susa in present-day Iran, And there are some people who have seen exactly the same thing as Nehemiah, but they have done nothing about it. God had laid on Nehemiah, Nehemiah's heart, a distress, a burden about what was happening in Jerusalem. And so last week in chapter 5, we looked at how do you know what is moral and right? How do you make decisions about what is the right thing to do? Chapter 6 is fairly robust in the opposition that Nehemiah faces. Last week we saw from the story that Nehemiah is utterly God-centered and focused. And that utterly changed his understanding of what was right. He saw the same thing as everybody else and he took a stand against it. When people were being disadvantaged and having to sell their property but also their children, he said this is wrong and made changes 
really to the city and to the nation. In a week where we watch a prime minister squirm in the face of, I didn't realize, and wait until what the the inquiry says what happened, you can see that Boris Johnson doesn't read Nehemiah 5. It's really obvious what's happening and how what is right is not being said. Hopefully you can see how much the Bible has to say right into life today. Hope you're able to see the contrast between a movable right and wrong and Nehemiah's life. You see that Nehemiah is focused on the task he has to do and he will not be distracted. He will not be afraid of others. He will not be tempted. He will not drift. It's timely both at the start of a new year when we often pause and reflect on how we're living. Maybe you've made resolutions. Sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings, but 92% of resolutions don't work. So it'll be interesting to see if the chocolate guys work over the year. We know, you know if you buy the newspaper in the first two weeks of January, they'll tell you how to get fit, how to eat healthy. We all make the same resolutions, or most of us make resolutions, if you make them, or try to improve ourselves or do those things that you're trying to do to change things in your life. So at the start of a new year, I think this is timely, but also as we come to the two-year point of living in a global pandemic, at some level we're beginning to think, how is this going and how have we got through this far? And the hope that it changes in the months ahead, but I could be saying the same thing to you next year as we wait for it to end. We don't know what's ahead, but we can think about how we're doing in this. So allowing Nehemiah to hold our thinking for a little bit this morning, (coughs) Nehemiah spends 12 years in Jerusalem. That's how long he's in the city. From the point where he hears the the news that God's people are in disgrace and distress, he takes four months for prayer, He then goes to the king and asks for permission to go back and rebuild the walls. What you find in Nehemiah 6 is actually the wall took 52 days. In 12 years, he's famous for building the wall, but actually it didn't take long. It's shorter than than kids or grandkids' summer holidays. It's quite incredible in the story. You picture the wall takes, the wall must have taken 11 and a half years. No, 52 days. He was there for 12 years re-establishing the city. If this was a TV show or movie, Tobiah, Geshem, and Sam Ballot are the obvious bad guys. There's no twist, there's no big reveal, it's not a BBC drama where with two minutes to go to 10 o'clock, there's a twist and you go, oh my goodness, they're the killer, I didn't see it coming. And the whole way through Nehemiah, you see Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, you almost could boo at this point. They are the bad guys. Every time they do something, boo, it's, they are the obvious villains in the piece. But Nehemiah knows the right thing to do. And in chapter 6, we get an example or a model of his clear-headedness and single-mindedness. It's a story of temptation and distraction, but how in his, his formation he is not tempted or distracted. So word came to the bad guys. The job is almost done. They are afraid that once the gates are on, the city will be secure. They can't then conquer the city. They can't then disrupt the city. Once the walls are up and the gates are on, the city becomes defendable. People can move inside it. You close it off, and really the only way you conquer it is by siege. It becomes incredibly costly to try and defeat them. And so Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, it's almost like a fairy tale. They're coming to distract and to tempt. Come and join us four times. Come, come and meet with us. You can see it. it's a masterful storytelling in the text because it's very short, and you get a full picture of what's happening. Come and join us. And Nehemiah doesn't get fooled. He sends messengers in response. And I think the key sentence in chapter 6 is, I am doing a great work. I can't come down. He gives reasons. Why should the work stop? This is a situation of all hands on deck. We learned earlier that women and men were building the wall. Tradesmen, perfumers, goldsmiths, everyone is in on this, apart from the nobles of Tekoa. I mentioned in the chapter is the one, the one group of people who didn't do anything forevermore. But everybody else is involved in this. Four times they ask. They are persistent, relentless, and continually trying to tempt him away from what he's doing. But Nehemiah doesn't move. Fear of others. It says in the text that we've just read, that he, then, he then gets sent an unsealed letter. It's really clear that everybody else knows what's in the letter. That's why it's unsealed. I'm going to give you this letter and everybody else knows what we're telling you too. We are pulling other people in to this. And inside the letter is temptation. You are planning to become king, to lead the people in revolt. You're even appointing prophets to do your bidding. 
and the threat is plain, we will report this back to Artaxerxes and really good luck to you after that. But we have told everybody else around you, this is your plan, this is what you're hoping to do. We've told other people, they're trying to give him fear of others and to simply intimidate him. And the fear is real because Artaxerxes was in charge of most of the world and he could have him killed in an instant. But Nehemiah, formed in truth, knows that all of this is lies and he even knows what their plan is. And he says in verse 9, he's a great storyteller of putting this together. The plan is that he would become weak and then the job would not be completed. Nehemiah's response at this stage in chapter 6 shouldn't really surprise us at all because he just simply says, and then I prayed. When Nehemiah is in trouble, he prays. He prays all the time. He brings everything back to God. That's who he's formed to be. When he meets difficulty and challenge, he prays. That's his inbuilt response, even in exile, even 130 kilometers away from his country that has been invaded and taken over. And then in a great twist, because they accuse Nehemiah of bribing and paying off prophets, and Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, they pay off a prophet. They do what they have accused him of doing. In the real world, they do that and then try to entice Nehemiah. The technical part in the text that isn't there is at this point in Jewish history, if anybody else but the priest goes into the temple, they should be killed. So the, the prophet is saying, come, come, we'll meet in the temple, we'll close the door and all will be fine. Nehemiah's going, no, it won't. Because I can be killed for going into the temple. And they've paid off the prophet to do this. And Nehemiah in verse 14 again models how we respond to many things. He comes to God in prayer. I think in chapter 6 we see an example of a life lived with purpose in the face of distraction, of fear, of temptation, and even just drifting off living as we should. I am doing a great work and I can't come down. And so I would suggest to you this morning, do you know your great work? Do you know the thing that you shouldn't be tempted away from? How will you spend your one and only life? Another way to consider this, and I have a friend who says this regularly to his church family that he's in, and I find it a brutally tough statement. And he's careful that I say that before I say this. He says, what will I say at your funeral? And then he would go further and say, make my job easy. Do something. I think that's very, very blunt. It's way more blunt than I would ever be with anybody. There is that space in our lives of what is the great work in our lives. It's quite timely, I think, that we reflect on this at this point, both in the year but also in the pandemic. I do think what will be said at your funeral is a hard question. But if we're honest and think about our lives, we probably at this stage in our lives have been to a tribute or eulogy at a funeral that was a variation of, they liked to drink at the weekend and they really liked quiz shows or they liked bingo. Those things are fine for somebody to do. But when it comes to the end of your life, I think we all hope that there's more in our life than that. It doesn't mean that you live a life of Nehemiah, that two and a half thousand years later they're writing books about you and people are meeting to discuss your life. I think that's probably a little bit beyond most of us. I'm not aiming for that in my life, that in 2,000 years' time people will gather to reflect on Reuben's eye. I think that's a bit too far. But you've also been at funerals or moments of eulogy and tribute where somebody has lived what by many definitions would be a modest life. But you see the testimony of a life that's lived well and lived with content and lived with love for others. You will have been in rooms where people speak of somebody who has died and there are a large number of people there who have been impacted by that person or by their family and friends and the impact of a life. You see that. It's not just about making a name. Just in case you think, Reuben said we should all be like Nehemiah. I don't think I have a huge city building construction project in me. That's not what I'm saying. But it's that question of what is our great work? What is our purpose? And in turn then, how do we resist distraction, fear of others, temptation? I think we all know times where there's things that you're doing something and somebody comes along and says, can you do this? And you're like, no, no, I'm doing this. I need to get this done. Because it has priority in your life. It could be as simple as putting the Christmas tree up or depending on your rhythm of your house, taking it back down and everybody has a different time for it coming down. Some of you are down on Boxing Day. You are not leaving it up the day after Boxing Day. And some of you, it's the 6th of January. Some of you have a date and a time. And if somebody said, no, no, do you want to come and do this? No, no, this has to happen now. That's a very trivial example of something. But there are moments in life 
where things take priority over something else and you don't do other things because this is what needs to happen. Let me give you three practical examples of this from other people's lives. Of I am doing a great work and I can't come down. Corrie ten Boom. Her book, The Hiding Place, is the story of a completely ordinary Dutch family made unbelievably extraordinary by their commitment to Jesus and what he placed in front of them. Before they were arrested, before they built their secret room in their home, the Nazis had invaded Holland, banning Jewish citizens from being allowed to walk openly in the streets. So Corrie ten Boom began picking up and delivering her family's watch shop work for Jewish customers in their home. A bit like click and collect, only with the threat of Nazism and death, so it's not exactly the same as that, but that sense of going door to door. One evening, <coughs> she was on such an errand in the home of a doctor and his family, the Heemstras, and they were talking about all the things that you discuss whenever your, your country has been conquered and the threat of that. But in the middle of their conversation, down the stairs piped a kid's voice, Daddy, you didn't tuck us in. The doctor Himstra was on his feet in an instant. With an apology to his wife and to Corrie ten Boom, he hurried upstairs and in a, mim- in a minute we heard a game of hide and seek and the shrill laughter of two children. That was all. Nothing had changed. Mrs. Himstra continued with her recipe for stretching the tea ration and trying to make the house continue to work and yet everything in the home had been changed. For in that instant, reality broke through the numbness that they were experiencing. The reality of what was truly important. These children, this mother and father, might at any moment be ordered under the back of a truck and taken away. And yet the important thing was the love within the family. In Corrie ten Boom's book, she responded in this with the fact that a prayer was forming in her heart. Lord Jesus, I offer myself for your people in any way, in any place, and any time. Which becomes the testimony of her life. I am doing a great work and I can't come down. There are two aspects in the story that I think are interesting about Corrie ten Boom. One is Dr. Heemstra, faced with all sorts of persecution, very real, and his kids have the priority. His family has the priority. He stops other things to go and spend time with him. He knows what's important in his life and makes changes to what he's doing in response to that. But the other obvious part is what was forming in Corrie ten Boom's life where she saved many, many people by doing a great work and not doing other things. Eugene Peterson is the pastor and translator of the message that we read this morning. Um, He's a Presbyterian pastor who has died in the last number of years in America. He wrote the message as well as about 30 other books. But as he was translating the message from the original Greek and Hebrew text into contemporary English language, that's what the message really is. It's a paraphrase of, of the Bible in very contemporary words. But... Bono from the band U2 was using the message and really enjoying it. He was giving it out to the famous people that he knew all the time and he really wanted to meet Eugene Peterson. And so U2, being in a rock band world, offered to send their plane and fly him to wherever in the world they were. They would put him up, look after him so they could meet him. And um, Eugene Peterson said no. And I heard him being interviewed a few years later and it was like, you t- you're one of the few people in the world who turned down Bono. And his response was, it was Isaiah. Because he was translating Isaiah at that time, and he was like, I am doing a great work, and I can't come down. And everybody else who really likes rock bands were going, I can't believe you didn't take this opportunity. And he went, there's more important things in my life than going to do this fancy thing by modern definitions. I am doing a great work, and I can't come down. Let me show you a wee picture. So my friend Ben took this in Death Valley, which I think is in Nevada. And in the middle of the picture, in the middle of that dot, is the star Polaris. And so he took the picture and was focused on the star Polaris in the middle. And if you pause, everything else blurs around it. Everything else fades behind it. He has other pictures of everything being sharp. He knows what he's doing. It's beyond me how he does this. What do you think in your life? When you know your great work, Everything else blurs just a little bit. Still important, but it's not as important as to what's at the center. I am doing a great work and I can't come down. Nehemiah knew his great work. He knew in his life what he was called to do and what he was meant to do. And that meant that other things moved outside of that. Hopefully that connects with me or visual and that might make more of an impact than, than, than audible stories. That space of when you know your great work, when distraction comes... 
when temptation comes, when fear of others comes, or when drift in our life comes, actually, if you know what's at the center of your life or what your great work is, then actually those other things get pushed to the outside. Corey Ten Boom, Eugene Peterson, even a, I actually don't even know how to describe that photo. It's a mix of being very, very clever, and it disorientates me if I look at it for too long. Um, but they all know their great work and what they won't do as a response of knowing that. We have often come back to the fact that Nehemiah is centered on God. Nehemiah lives his life pre-Jesus. And in Jesus, we see the full revelation of God. So Nehemiah knows some of what God has revealed at this point. And in Jesus, we know what God wants us to know in fullness. And so what you have is the reality would be, if we can skip on one, Alan, thanks. You fill your name in. And the great work of our lives is that we are centered on Jesus. That is the great work of what we are called to be, who we are called to be in our lives. We were sick with COVID in December. And so for three days, it was fairly lawless in our house. Malachi thought it was great because he didn't have very many symptoms and he got to eat whatever he wanted really at any time of day, just for a couple of days. We were so great. I was like, that's fine, honey. You just eat that. That's good. So he thought he had a great review of COVID. But we weren't really centered on anything for three or four days. We were just really all sick together. And then we watched bits and pieces of TV and we did other things that you're just getting through for those couple of days as you're feeling really grim and everybody else is grim. So we're just doing our best to muddle through. You watch a bit of TV. There was a point in day two when I went, I don't want to watch TV anymore. I don't want to watch anything that anybody's offering me on any streaming service or channel. I don't care. I just want to be well. I was not made just to be entertained. In the modern world, we have more distraction in our lives than at any other time. I remember I tried to explain to our kids that TV, kids' programs used to be on from four to half past five. Some of you remember when they weren't even on that much, the TV wasn't on from four to half past five. I tried to explain that there were only three channels and that became four. Malachi just does not comprehend because you watch what you want when you want now in the modern world. There is more distraction now for people of faith, but for the whole country, than at any other stage in human history. I read a Dutch theologian called Abraham Kuyper, which makes me sound smarter than I am, but that's why I read him, because he, he makes me think. And Abraham Kuyper, in about the early 1900s, was terrified about the daily newspaper. He said, this is a real threat to Christian faith, because Christians will read the newspaper rather than reading their Bible. And he's talking about a penny news sheet in Holland 100 years ago. And I think, oh my goodness me, how much more distraction is there in my life available to me? You can read newspapers from all over the world, on your tablet, on your phone, on, on your computer in the house. You can watch news channels by the hundred or TV channels by the hundred. We have so much more to distract us that I think Nehemiah 6 really speaks into that of what is the center of our lives. Some of you are watching more news in the last two years than you've watched in the previous 50 there's some that's important. It's good to know what the, what the rules are, what you can do, what you can't do. But there's also a bit of that can't be what we're orientated around. Part of the unmasking of the past two years is the unmasking of what is my life centered around? What is at the heart of this? If you're not a follower of Jesus, I would still ask the question, what is the great work of your life? Is it to have a nice house for your kids to be raised and find employment somewhere. Is that the great work? That there is a goodness in that that we all aim for in terms of our family members and those we love. We want them to do well. But is that the totality of what God put you on the earth for? What is our great work that then decides what you do and what you don't do? Who are you living for? Many of those things are really, really good. Many of the things that you will work for in your life are really good. But they're not the ultimate thing that will last in your life or forever. I am doing a great work and I can't come down. What is your great work? And if you're a bit older this morning, you're thinking, well, you know something, I've done a great work. We've put a shift in. We've worked hard for a long time. Your great work changes. It changes as you go through life. Because a no page in the Bible is retirement. I'm sorry to tell you that. There's no gold watch. We mark things. We mark George's 50 years. But retirement's a different thing. There's no pipe and slippers in the Bible. There's no, and Paul sat down and stopped. That's not how it works. Our great work changes as we go through life. And this is not a recruitment drive for, I need you to do things in church. That's not what this is. There's no sign-up sheet in the, in the porch to say, we need you to sign up to do stuff. 
But it's that sense of asking the question of what, what is my life centered on? What is it that I'm centered on that I'm also then not distracted out of or tempted, tempted away from that I'm not worried about the fear of others for? As followers of Jesus, we know so much more than Nehemiah and you. We can know the Messiah and live our lives in service to him. And in life, our great work might change as we go through it. But Nehemiah 6 at least provokes us to consider how we spend our lives. Nehemiah did his great work in 52 days, but he was there for 12 years. So his great work had to change because he wasn't just there to construct a wall. He was there to help build a nation. We talk about him two and a half thousand years later. I'm not sure they'll talk about any of us in two and a half thousand years' time. But there's also the bit of what is our purpose in life? What are we living for? If you're a pupil or a student, part of your great work will be at this stage, if you're at school, to do your work, to go to school and do your work as best you can. If you're an employee, part of it will be to be a good employee or employer, if that's something that you do. If you're married, you will be called to honour God in your marriage. If you're single, you're called to honour God in your singleness. If you're a child, God calls us to honour him by obeying and honouring our parents. But also if you're a parent, you're called to love and raise and respect your kids. I don't have an answer for Nehemiah 6 in the sense of telling you what your great work is. But I do get to bring it to you and say, it is worth thinking in this season of life. And I don't mean I sat down for 10 minutes with a cup of tea in the kitchen and went, oh, I have my great work and I've written it down. Nehemiah spends four months praying through this. But as we sit in a pandemic, what is our great work in the season that we're in, but also as we look ahead in church life? What will mark us as a church? But you will also go, I can't do that because I'm doing this, and this is what I was made for. Frederick Bigner has a quote that you find your purpose in life where your greatest joy and the needs of the world come together. So you find the thing that you love to do, but meets the needs of the world, and God places you in those places in those areas, and you live for him in that place, enjoying what you are made to do ultimately, but also meeting the needs of the world around us. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down and it will not surprise you that we finish by remembering that Christ is the one who models this. On the cross, he did the great work and did not come down. He was not distracted. He was not tempted. Everyone was against him on the cross. He had no fear of others. He did not drift. He did absolutely everything in his life for us so that we could also have a life that is modeled in the model that he gives us of being centered on him and everything else moving and finding its place outside of that. Nehemiah 6, two and a half thousand years old and I think incredibly timely for 2022. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Nehemiah. We thank you that he did this great work. And even as each aspect of this story engages us and confronts us and challenges us, but also encourages us. Because we see in Nehemiah's life, a life lived on purpose, a life lived where he is not distracted or intimidated, he is not fearful. He is centered on you, but he is also then doing the work that you called him to. Father, that raises all sorts of questions for each of us. And Father, we humbly submit to your leading in our lives. That whether in the church family or in the community or in our, the family that you placed us in, that there is great work for us to do that refines our life and gives us purpose, but also will become the testimony of our life that we lived as your people where you'd placed us to be. Father, we ask that your spirit would come upon us and enable us to see what we were made for. Help us as a church family to be able to see and discern your leading in these days that we are in, but also in the next 5, 10, and 50 years. As we begin to consider the great work that we will say, this is our great work and we can't come down. We can't move and do these other things. This is what we were called to be here to do in this time. We submit to you above all. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the great work that he did that makes all of this come true and real in our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.
Forgive me for this bit. Oh, sorry, Lennons. <laughs> These are just for us, just to clear. I'm not putting them online or anywhere. It just gives us a record of who's in the service. Okay, if you're in the hall, I'm going to suggest that you come through the church and it gives you an opportunity to, in a socially distanced and sensible way, to see some others as you're leaving rather than going out the other door. But you're free to go out the other door as well. Um, Let me say the grace before we do some practical things. We say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining with us if you're online and in the hall. (laughs) 